What is up guys, that's it here, with a very important question this time. What is your favorite aspect of Diablo 3? Did you answer to yourself? I'm willing to bet a lot of you said that the visceral combat is your favorite aspect of the game and that's a great and very legitimate reason to love Diablo 3, the combat feels amazing. Some of you probably said that getting loot is your favorite aspect, seeing the beam shoot up towards the sky when you get a legendary item. And the lore lovers among us probably said that the rich, blood-soaked history of Sanctuary is what draws them in. But rarely do I hear praise of the amazing designs of the world that surround you as you play. And that's actually a large part of why I love Diablo 3 so much. If you slow down the frantic pace of your farming just a little bit to soak in the world around you, I'm sure you'll understand what I mean. Let me show you some of my favorite places in the game. There are a lot of things to remember Dalgor Oasis by. It's one of the largest zones in Diablo as a whole, rivaled only by the Paths of the Drowned and the Blood Marsh in Reaper of Souls. It's the home of the arguably strongest Key Warden in the game, Sokar. It's also the place where you're first introduced to Zoltan Kul, probably the most grey area character in the entire game, for whom to this day debates arise whether we should have killed him or not. But it's also a place of mystery, of which we get a single glimpse through the writings of Abd al-Hazir. He says that Dalgor was actually a person who three centuries ago promised the growing city of Chaldeum water from an oasis of unparalleled splendor that was previously thought to be a deserted wasteland. The only thing that he asked for was the oasis to be named after himself. At the time of the events of Diablo 3, it's pretty evident that he succeeded in turning the desert into a water haven filled to the brim with palm trees and tall grass. It's one of my most memorable places in Act 2. The sounds of Tower of the Damned and Cursed are usually what first springs to mind, the menacing noise of the demonic forges spewing fire, the gurgling noises as blazing ghouls climb the walls to ambush you, or the taunts of the seductively dangerous Sidea voiced by Claudia Black. But in my opinion the visuals are just as memorable. Enormous chains surrounding you, blood-red haze obscuring your vision, and of course the anguished figures of the flayed demons with the ever-disturbing knowledge that the tower floors you walk upon are paved with their skins. The towers are followed by two very memorable boss fights with Sidea and Asmodan, don't get me wrong, but it's those quiet moments in between fights where you hear the sounds of torture, the strain of metal links, and you see the chains protruding directly from the eyes of the flayed demons that truly make you feel like you're in hell. Act 1 is probably the most varied act of the original 4 and nothing shows it off better than the seamless transition between the dry plains of the fields of misery into the drenched bog of the festering woods. Hardcore fans of the original Diablo certainly remember this zone well, whether with fondness or nausea depends on how you felt about the Nephilim Valor system, but one thing is undeniable. The Festering Woods is everything a dark fantasy forest should be. Rotten to the core, dotted with crumbling landmarks and steeped into the history of the Nephilim and their tragic struggle with the demon Nereza. To this day I hold a distinct memory from around release, descending into the warrior's rest, seeing the ruins of the Nephilim city below and finding out it's not included as a dungeon and breaking my heart. Allow me to take a huge leap right into the high heavens for my next favorite spot. The Diamond Gates are introductory area of Act 4 that you usually rush through because of the huge build-up in the story, demanding that you press onward. When I visited on my own, however, I was captivated by the mixture of purity and corruption that is not really displayed in such reflective solitude in the other Act 4 zones. If you take a few steps behind the portal to the Vestibule of Light, something that you rarely think of doing if you're playing regularly, 
you'll be treated into one of the most memorable vistas of the high heavens. The sun shining through the unearthly, tall architecture of the angels and illuminating the creeping demonic corruption below. There are no demons and angels fighting, no words shared between the characters, just the gaping wounds of evil's influence across what was once a pure surface. The sun doesn't just shine on the heavens though, it also glares harshly across sanctuary, drying up the land and bleaching the bones of the dead across the desolate sands. Easily my favorite of the Act 2 desert areas, the desolate sands contains one of the most farmed goblin spots near its entrance and one of the most popular dungeons in the original game, Vault of the Assassins. The cracked, barren surface is evocative by itself, but it's the bubbling tar pits and the brittle rib cages of creatures both big and small, curving helplessly towards the sun, that truly set the desolate sands apart. Journals scattered across the dead bodies speak of how no one has ever survived exile in this place, and you need only glimpse to the devastation around the edges to believe that. Sometimes though, death is not brought by nature itself, but by the wickedness of a human hand. Leoric's manor is one such example. Fallen years ago to the demonic influence, then abandoned and succumbing to the erosive powers of time, and now, once again, bloodied by crazed cultists. The manor retains some of the marks of its former glory, the beautiful winding stairs, the stained glass windows, but the trail of bodies, both cultist and innocent, and the menacing creak of the manor doors prepare you for a tale that will end in entrails rather than glory. It's quite fitting that the manor is the prelude to one of the most classic looking dungeons in the game, the Halls of Agony, but it's in this reflective moment on the balcony, rain tapping on your shoulders, with countless cultists falling behind you and a horde awaiting below, and seeing the devastation of the Tristram Cathedral far below you, you truly feel the despair in the lands of Kanduras. Other times it's not about subtlety, it's about the thunder of explosions, the shriek of bombardments from the sky and the smoke of enormous battle fires choking the air. No other place in Diablo carries the feeling of a living war as well as Rakis Crossing. Named after Rakis, a crusader, one of the most devout champions of Zakarum and founder of Westmarch, this narrow pass into Ariat carries a lot of the traits of its namesake. Straightforward, bloodied and battle-worn. With the way it forces a battle after battle onto you, it's easy to miss many beautiful details of the zone. The mountain slope in the distance, pale against the roaring flames, the torn banners with the wolf of Corvus as their sigil, and the boiling lava seeping through the mountainside as you get closer to the edge of hell. But once I stopped to appreciate it all, I saw Rekis Crossing as something more than a framerate killer. And that was an easy choice, wasn't it? This zone is unique in many aspects. It's one of the few with a different viewing angle and is certainly the only one that moves as you fight in it. Like a reverse act 3, where you are the besieged one repelling an attack, in the ram scene you are the one sieging the lair of Malthiel for the final showdown of the expansion. Metal crashes against metal in huge sparks, your vision blurs as the battering ram charges towards the door of the fortress, Malthiel's minions, armed with hooks, try to stop your assault, its awesomeness packed into just several minutes. I could go on about the details, but honestly, you should just replay this quest to remind yourself of how good it feels to smash down death's door. My only regret is that there isn't a bounty tied to the ram. I would be itching to do it every time I go for bounties. It might be the polar opposite of the quiet majesty of the diamond gates. 
the soaring heaven shall tremble theme, the urgency of Tyriel's words, the fallen bodies of Imperius and his angel cohorts, the bone prison capturing your companion, but the hallmarks of Act 4 are all there. The angelic beauty marred by the forces of hell, statues of nameless angels rusted and falling, demonic growth overtaking the gentle curves of the platforms. You can, of course, see Diablo's stronger influence corrupting the pinnacle of heaven in a much more pronounced manner than the lower levels. The once white tiles are now a rusted bronze and the circular ornaments are barely visible beneath the thick layer of hellish matter. Putrid air seeps around the platform and as you get closer to the end, the screen starts to shake and you know you're in for a fight. The only place that can trump facing the prime evil himself is, of course, the lair of the Angel of Death. While the conflict in the high heavens could be viewed as removed from the concerns of mankind depending on your views of angels in the Diablo universe, the fight with Malthiel, threatening to consume the souls of all living, feels much more urgent and personal. Walking among the broken remains of the Pandemonium Fortress, debris precariously floating around you and seeing the souls of mankind consumed by the growing power of the Reaper of Souls is a powerful image. The scene itself lacks any urgent colors and sounds, it simply emanates the coldness of oblivion. As I stood there, watching souls silently crash into the surface of the orb of deathly power, I was convinced that this was the most powerful scene in the entire game. Well, this is it for me. I hope you like what you saw and you'll share what are your favorite places to visit in the game. If you enjoyed my thoughts, I would greatly appreciate your subscription to my channel. As always, keep in touch with the Twitter and Facebook that I linked below and I'll see you guys next time.